Hello and welcome to another video that isn't just showing you how to get the top grades, it's showing you how to get 100%. And it comes to us courtesy of Live Dash, who is a user on my channel who's taken English literature possibly a year early, I'm not sure. And Live Dash, I know it's a he, um, has offered us his 100% answers. So we'll be looking at a 30 out of 30 answer on an inspector calls uh, from paper two. And on paper one, we'll be looking at a 30 out of 30 answer on Macbeth and a 30 out of 30 on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I'm going to answer these six questions. How long should my essay be if I want to get 100%? Should I use joined up handwriting or does it matter if I don't? Should I plan my answer at the beginning in the exam? Should I start with the extract if it's an extract question, or should I go straight into the whole text? How will I know what quotations to use? And then finally, how will I make the examiner want to give me full marks at the beginning of each essay? So if you want to find out, check it out. Right, let's look at the beginning of his Macbeth answer. Arguably, Shakespeare develops Macbeth and Bankrow's attitudes as evolving standpoints shaped by their moral endurance against the trials of human kindness. So how does this automatically get the examiner to think, really, I want to give this full marks at the beginning? Well, firstly, he's gone straight in and linked a quotation to Shakespeare's purpose. Well, secondly, he's actually given us what that purpose is, and it's a sophisticated one. There are actually three parts to Shakespeare's purpose here. So part number one is Shakespeare wants to give us the attitudes of the character. Part number two is he wants to show that those attitudes change during the play. They evolve. Okay, they are evolving standpoints. And then thirdly, he wants to show that was what makes those um, attitudes change is there different moral attitudes, but more specifically, whether they can hold on to their morals. That's what he means by moral endurance. So Banquo, he's going to argue, I imagine, that Banquo holds on to his moral viewpoint. Um, Macbeth starts as a moral character, but he can't hold on to it. Okay, And then there's this sophisticated idea of what is it that... Um, they are engaged in, they are engaged in a trial. This is a really useful way of looking at the play where Shakespeare comes along and he tests the moral attitudes of these two characters and Macbeth's moral attitude fails the trial and Banquo's moral attitude survives it. Banquo remains with his human kindness intact and Macbeth has his human kindness taken away. So we can see how sophisticated this opening is. Now let's look at the opening of the Jekyll and Hyde answer. Stevenson creates mystery and tension as he relates the novella's events to the precept that man is not truly one but two. Semicolon duplicity. Now this isn't as sophisticated but it still has some of those elements. He goes straight in with Stevenson's purpose. That is a key thing, looking at the writer's reasons for doing what they've done. He again goes straight in by linking it to a quotation, and he's linked it to one theme here, um, duplicity. So these are two key skills that he keeps reminding us to use. Let's now look at his inspector call answer. Priestley explores the concept of social class, as well as its implementation as a regrettable feature of the early 1900s. Edwardian commitment to social class forms a key aspect of society. Priestley attempts to challenge the importance of social class uh, presented through its impact. So once again, he goes in straight away with the author's purpose. Why is he doing it? Um, he's questioning the Edwardian commitment to social class. Here, instead of linking to a quotation, he's linked to some historical context which is relevant to the question. 
OK, let's now consider planning. So what has he done with his plan here? Well, this essay on uh, an inspector calls is in paper two. And in paper two, you don't get the extract question. So he has made a kind of a plan, but not really. What he's really done is thought about the question, or oh, it's about social class, and then he's banged out every quotation that he's memorized in his revision to do with social class. Now, obviously, he's thought through what are the likely themes that are going to come up. And being a good student, he knows that social class will come up no matter what the question is. OK, even if the question is about Mrs. Burling, it's still a question about social class. So these quotations are not just learnt for one question in the exam, should it come up. They are learnt for every single question. So he's used his time very wisely to bang these out really quickly. He's not worried about the order yet. Uh, if we go through it, he hasn't really decided in the planning stage which one to use first. Um, he's just trusted that as soon as he starts writing, he'll know that he's got to move to one of these quotations. In other words, planning uh, is often a waste of time. OK, what he's done is just the bare minimum. With the extract questions, here's Jekyll and Hyde. He hasn't bothered to plan anything. He's just gone straight in with the extract to give himself that opportunity to start writing. With the Shakespeare question, he's just gone straight in again, no plan at all, and then he's gone straight in with the extract. Here's the quotation, instruments of darkness tells us truth, wins us with honest trifles to betray us. And so he's picked a quotation from the extract that exactly matches what he wants to say about Banquo. So our advice about should I plan my answer needs to come with a health warning. OK, so the health warning is uh, this candidate is obviously operating at a high level already. They're already able to write at a grade seven level. Once you get to that grade seven level, then you know you're good enough not to have your plan because you know the text well enough. If you're someone who doesn't know the text well enough, then it might be really useful for you to plan um, three points or five points, whatever it is that you're going to make in your essay. But the key is to do that super quickly, OK? Because you don't get any marks for your plan. Your plan is just a way for you to organise your ideas. In the extract question, I encourage my students not to plan. They don't need to. And the reason is you'll write something about the extract, and that will remind you of something about the play as a whole, and then you'll, you know, go on to the play as a whole and write about the play as a whole here. And then your essay just bounces from extract to play as a whole to extract to play as a whole. And you know you're answering both parts of the question. And the plan takes care of itself. If your writing is not yet grade 7, I would recommend a different method. So if you're not yet at grade 7, I would do this with your plan. I would write about the novel or the play as a whole first because that's when you get the answers for why the author is including all this stuff all this idea about how the author is constructing a piece of fiction and why they're constructing it it's much easier to do that when you're writing about the novel as a whole or the play as a whole if you're not a superb candidate already and that means that when you get to the extract, you will already know what you want to say about it because you've already planned uh, what you wanted to say about it in the novel as a whole or in the play as a whole. So that technique I recommend for students who are at grade six, perhaps. But if you're already a grade seven writer, you can afford to just bang into the extract and then go to the whole text. OK, question five. How will I know what quotations to use? Well, there are two answers to that. In the extract question, you'll find it in the extract itself. And then you go on to talk about something elsewhere in the novel. Here it is about the supernatural and how that theme is explored elsewhere. And he finds a quotation that fits that theme. Why hath it given me earnest of success, commencing in the truth? With Jekyll and Hyde, he quotes straight from the extract, the fog would be quite broken up. 
Then he goes elsewhere in the novel. Stevenson creates uh, irony, or rather tension through the irony, of the construct of Mr. Hyde as he describes him as Henry Jekyll's favourite. So we have another quotation from elsewhere in the novel that will link back, and this idea that I talked about of viewing each character as a construct, something that the writer has constructed in order to teach a lesson. Okay, the question I haven't answered is this, should I use joined up handwriting? And as you can see, uh, we've not seen joined up handwriting here. So why then, Mr. Salas, do you keep telling your students that they should use joined up handwriting? Well, if we look at this answer, that's page one, page two, and page three, and a bit of page four. That's quite a lot, but it's only, I say that advisedly, it's only about 600 words. Uh, so he's got a really, really great mark, only writing about 600 words. And his next answer, one page, two page, three page, and a tiny bit. And that's much less than 600 words, but has still got full marks. Okay, well, in my later videos, I'll go through each essay and you'll see exactly how he got full marks. But if you use joined up handwriting, you'll simply write more quickly. And students of mine in school, who tend to get um, grade nine in my lessons, usually write around 900 words, so 30% more. And that means that I can get grade nines out of students who aren't in a top set. Uh, generally, I do that. So students who are just predicted to get a five uh, or a six will get grade nine in my class. Not all of them, obviously, you know, just a handful. But the way that they do that is by making as many sophisticated points as they can. That's important to bear in mind because because Live Dash is a very, very articulate student. Uh, really, really understands the text, but also writes with a brilliant vocabulary. Uh, so my message is, you know, if you're already getting a really strong grade sevens or even grade eights with handwriting that isn't joined up, then you're going to be able to get a grade nine with handwriting that isn't joined up. But if you need to write more quickly um, and joined up handwriting is necessary for you to do that, then joined up handwriting will be an essential skill. In other words, being able to write 800 to 900 words to get your top grade will be a really, really useful skill. So look out for these 100% answer videos, which I will be making on Macbeth and Jekyll and Hyde and and Inspector Calls, courtesy of this fantastic student who's been so generous in giving us his essays. If you have some really high quality essays you would also like my viewers to learn from, please submit them below, post them down below, or email me, um, post me a comment and I'll get back to you. And uh, if you want a shout out, I'll give you that as well. I haven't given uh, our writer here um, a shout out in terms of his real name because he might not want us to know but uh, I'm sure he'll let me know by the time I make the next videos. Again thank you very very much and subscribe if you'd like more videos to help you get 100% in your English literature exam.